Welcome to our webinar. Boy, are we excited today to talk to you about discovering your strengths and sales superpowers. Unfortunately, I have some bad news. Uh, Ken Krog, who is going to be doing this webinar today with Paul Allen from Gallup, ran into a personal um, injury, and unfortunately, uh, although he is okay, he will not be joining today. So I, Gabe Larson, will be filling in for him. Um, and be uh, delivering this webinar with uh, our good friend Paul Allen from Gallup. With that, I'd like to introduce myself and Paul. Paul is the chief evangelist at Gallup, um, but also brings a rich entrepreneurial history with him. Now, at Gallup, Paul has a twofold mission. Number one, he wants to find executives and corporations that want to build strengths-based organizations. And then number two, he's looking to build thousands of coaches who can help boost engagement and productivity by focusing on strengths. But before Gallup, as I mentioned, Paul was a serial entrepreneur. He did start and was the original CEO of Ancestry.com and then spent time at Family Link, a company he founded that for those of you who know, um, Family Link was a Facebook application that went pretty viral. Um, so we're excited to have Paul on board with us today. Real quick background on myself. Um, I run our momentum strategy team here at InsideSales.com. That team focuses on working with clients in the areas of people, systems, and processes, making sure that our clients achieve success. But before Inside Sales, um, I actually worked with Paul at Gallup. I was at Gallup about five years, um, and Paul and I crossed paths multiple times. And then um, prior to Gallup, I spent some time at Goldman Sachs at Accenture. So, Paul, over to you. All right, sounds good, Gabe. Thank you for that intro. I, uh, I'm really sorry about Ken's accident. I'm really relieved that he's okay. Ken and I go back about 25 years, and uh, we've been friends for a very long time. It's been fun to watch each other's careers over the years, and uh, we reconnected recently, and, and uh, Ken was gracious enough to invite me. Gabe, it's work, great to work with you tonight, uh, knowing that we go back at least 10 years, and, uh, and, so, and of course you have uh, spent some quality years at Gallup and understand a lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight. So I'm, I'm looking forward to collaborating with you through this, um, through this presentation. Um, three years ago, a friend of mine, and actually a friend of yours, uh, Gabe, uh, Clint Carlos called me up, and he knew that I had had some pretty lucky stints in my career with hypergrowth companies. Actually, my first job in 1988 was with a software company that got 30 million, 40 million users in just a few years, and then uh, my own first company did okay, but then Ancestry was able to attract a lot of capital, a lot of users, and, and really become one of the name brand internet companies in the world. And then my Family Link experience uh, after Facebook launched their platform in 2007, we were able to get 80 million users in just two and a half years. And so I love viral marketing. And I love building products that are powerful and useful <clears throat> and good for society. And genealogy is you know, certainly that. And so um, people thought I was crazy three years ago after Clint introduced me to Gallup and to StrengthsFinder and to the concept of helping StrengthsFinder go viral. Um, they, were, they thought I was crazy that I left 22 years as an entrepreneur to go work for a large company. First time in my life being hired and working for a large company. But the <laughs> reason that I'm there and, and the reason that I put Don Clifton's photo up is that I am here at Gallup because of the work of Don Clifton, a brilliant, brilliant man, uh, started studying psychology in the 1950s. And here's what's interesting. He spent 50 years of his life answering and uh, asking and answering this question, what will happen when we think about what's right with people rather than fixating on what is wrong with them? As I became exposed to the strength finder idea and to the philosophy of viewing yourself and everyone around you through a lens of what's right with them and the strength they have, the talents they have, as opposed to all the deficits and weaknesses that all of us have. It was so powerful to me, and I wanted to join Gallup and use what I do best to leverage what they do best and to try to reach a billion people in the next you know, few decades 
um, with this philosophy, with this strategy, uh, system, and with this tool. So when Don so Clifton Paul, started, yes, pa Paul. Let me just ask a billion people: Where is? I mean, everybody here is familiar with the strengths. Where where is strength sitting right now? How many people um, have taken that? So three years ago, we were just around seven and a half million, and then we launched what we called the Stampede Movement, which was instead of making it hard for large corporations to get access to the assessment and making it nearly impossible for small and medium-sized companies to use it, we basically embraced e-commerce. We made it available on the Internet. You can purchase as many codes as you want. You can administer it. And, so, and we also started training uh, thousands of strengths coaches, independent strengths coaches, who can take the concept and help apply it to faith groups, schools, small businesses, and basically everybody under the Global 2000. Gallup StrengthsFinder is found in 94% of the Fortune 500 companies right now. It's that popular. Wow. Um, wow. And so we've gone from 7.5 million to 12.5 million, but it's accelerating. And I think we're on the verge of a really nice uh, hockey stick tipping point where you know, many, many millions of people per year uh, will discover their strengths. Awesome, awesome. So, so when Don Clifton got in, into the graduate school in, in Nebraska in the 1950s, he noticed, and you'll see this slide, this cartoon, all the books, almost all the books in the field of psychology for decades were to help diagnose what's wrong with everybody. And there are just so many books, there are so many um, people talking about, you know, what's wrong with people and how do you solve those problems? How do you fix people? And Don basically asked a different, a different question, and, uh, and, and he started this 50-year career, which has led to where Gallup is today, and, and it obviously attracted me and many, many other talented people and many um, passionate people who are considering themselves strength evangelists in their own city, in their own community. Um, so it's interesting because Don Clifton spent 50 years studying talent and building selection and recruiting instruments. And then uh, before he passed away 12 years ago, he created the Internet version, the StrengthsFinder 2.0 assessment, which is up to 12 point, for 12.5 million people. But Gallup is also a polling company. In fact, Don Clifton, his son Jim Clifton is the CEO of Gallup, and the Clifton family business acquired Gallup, the polling company, in the 1980s. So you've got this incredible combination of the world's greatest polling brand. We're now polling in 160 countries around the world, combined with this brilliant psychometric analysis uh, company that understands the innate talents within every human being. So you've got this global perspective uh, as Gallup advises leaders of the world in business, education, government, and faith about what's going on in the hearts and minds of people in every country. At the same time, we're studying individuals down to the very personal level, what talents exist in each human being and what is their full potential. So we have a really unique opportunity, I think, to study the world and to study individuals. And one of the poll questions we've asked around the world is, which do you think will help you improve, will help you improve the most, knowing your strengths or knowing your weaknesses? And in every single country, more people say, knowing my weaknesses would be more important to them. And so that's kind of the headwinds that we're facing as we try to roll out a, a worldwide strengths movement. So those who choose to focus on their strengths are a minority in every country in Gallup's study. Now, think about as a parent or as a young person coming home with a report card. If you came home with a report card that had two A's, couple B's and an F, conversation look like, Gabe? Um, in the I, know, States, I, know what it, I know what it looked like at my house, so I have no doubt it looked <laughs> like that in most homes, unfortunately. It is absolutely the case around the world that parents immediately focus on what's wrong. Why did you score badly in that? As opposed to an approach that I think would be a more positive uh, uh, approach where the child would if you praise the child and talk about what they did well and which subjects they're excelling in and which subjects they're enjoying the most, and then, of course, you don't want to ignore the F. You're going to have to come up with some way to, to, to solve that problem. But the instinctive reaction is to be critical. 
in fact, to be upset probably and, and to, you know, lead to a pretty, you know, confrontational uh, experience for the child. So this is the, another headwind that, that Gallup faces as, you know, and think about employer uh, feedback sessions, you know, annual reviews, right. performance reviews, which most employees dread because no matter how well you're performing or what you're doing well, there's always room for improvement, right? You're, you're struggling with this, you're not doing this well, and that's really why I think a lot of employees dread those performance reviews is it's mostly negative. And, Paul, why, why do you think that is? I mean, we've all sat in those performance reviews. I've had dozens over my career. Yeah, to your point, the first thing happens, you sit down and you kind of say, you know, here's the things, your areas of improvement. Why? I mean, any thoughts on why we, we do focus on, on the weakness rather than the strength in individuals? Well, it's a great question. So uh, years ago, the CEO of Manpower uh, was doing a, a presentation on leadership, and it's a three-minute video clip on YouTube. I really love this. He basically, and, and I think this is just common in management in general, he basically had the top performing salesperson in the history of Manpower. And every time he went to visit that gentleman, I think his name was Bill, he would compliment him and praise him for his incredible sales performance, and then he would say, but you haven't submitted your paperwork. Could you please submit your paperwork? And he did this year after year for like three years. And then finally it dawned on Lance Secretan, the CEO of Manpower, that he's not going to be able to turn the world's best salesperson into the world's best paper administrator, kind of detail-oriented follow-through person. And so he finally, he actually was trying to get Bill to, you know, hire somebody or do something. And so finally he said, Bill, I will never ask you again about your paperwork. I've hired someone at headquarters. They'll do your paperwork for you, and you just continue to sell and, and do what you do best. So I don't know why, but I think as a society, we, we don't just look at performance and results. We also look at how people perform. And there's a problem if we expect people to perform not only to achieve the results that we want, but in the way that we want them to do it. And in psychology, there's something called the mirror fallacy or the mirror image fallacy. I think it's called the mirror fallacy, where you think people are like you. The young, first-time entrepreneur, I remember sitting in meetings wondering, why are we having this meeting? Aren't all these people motivated? Don't they already know what to do? And can't they go and execute? Why are we having a meeting? It's wasting time and money. Because I assumed that everyone was a self-starter, had a strategic mind, and kind of was ambitious and wanted to have the same results that I did. And my goodness, how, how wrong I was. There are so many different types of people. Uh, and I think we just, I don't know. It's, I think it's psychologists are trying to figure this out, and certainly management consultants, management experts yeah. are trying to figure this out. But yeah, some of the companies in the world are now shifting from competency-based models to more strengths-based models, kind of positive psychology and strength psychology. So I think, I think we're making headway. Um, I'm going to skip the uh, – I mean, there's a, there, this slide basically was an experiment run decades ago about average readers versus above average readers and who would benefit most from a speed reading course. And it turns out that when you have some talent already and you're giving, given training and experience and some, some tools, your, er, your growth is – meteoric, but if you lack talent in a particular area and you're given that same investment, you get a modest improvement. And I think that's what the world needs to know is when you have natural talent and then investment is made, your improvement is incredible. If you ask most Americans, uh, this is a Peter Drucker quote, most Americans don't know what their strengths are. When you ask them, they look at you with a blank stare or they respond in terms of subject knowledge, which is the wrong answer. Peter Drucker talked a lot about a strengths-based approach to management. And he even said nobody should be a manager who looks for what's wrong with their employees rather than what's right with their employees. And so Peter Drucker and Don Clifton came to the same conclusion through very different paths. But I think it's really powerful uh, when you start getting managers and leaders to believe this. So Paul, you know, certainly because to that point that Peter Drucker says, right? So most Americans don't know their strengths or maybe what kind of makes them tick. But so to find that out, certainly you can take the, the strengths finder. But if you broke it down into simple terms, I mean, how can more people 
understand their strengths? I mean, is there a breaking it down to the core? What is it? How do I understand understand my strengths better? Well, I mean, I think an assessment is a brilliant starting point, and then lots of conversations with people that know you best and also people you work with. Um, I, I think that there are multiple paths to it. If you Google something called Five Clues to Talent, John Clifton came up with the five things you should think about yourself to determine what areas of talent you might possess, even if you don't take an assessment. So there are multiple ways to get uh, a good view of, of what your talents are. But I personally think StrengthsFinder 2.0 is the best thing out there. And right. here's some assumptions that, you know, the headwinds I was talking about where why aren't we taking a strengths-based approach. Um, there are some bad assumptions out there that all behaviors can be learned. If you try hard enough, you can do it. You can basically be anything you want. The best in a row all get there exactly the same way. You know, leadership, you should be like Abraham Lincoln or you should be like, you know, George Washington or, Sheryl Sandberg, or you should lead however other people lead. No, every leader leads in their own authentic way based on their natural talents. Another assumption is that fixing weaknesses leads to success. We believe based on decades of research that some behaviors can be learned, but many are nearly impossible to learn. And there's this raw talent that is different from skills and knowledge, and that we also know that the best in a role deliver the same positive outcomes, but they use different behaviors um, and, and patterns to get there. And then fixing weaknesses does prevent failure, but strengths development leads to excellence. And that's what we're wow. trying to, to, to accomplish. Don Clifton wanted everyone in the world to experience excellence in their life. And he fully believed I mean, that every person had enough talent to do that. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty, you know, a couple of those points on the last slide, Paul, that's pretty radical. That's kind of going against the it's a good old American dream, right? I mean, I can be yeah. whoever I want. I can be however I want, whenever I want. Um, but I get it. I mean, I can see, um, especially that point you say where fixing weaknesses prevents failure, strength drives excellence. I mean, you can't be a jack of all trades, kind of master of none. That's sometimes where you where you fall. So interesting. Yeah, and by studying the top performers and by intensely studying success for decades, this is where Don Clifton realized that the most successful people were not just trying to shore up all their areas of weakness. They discovered at a young age that they had real talent in some area, and then they soared with that talent and accomplished incredible things. I mean, think of Steve Jobs. We could all be obsessed about what he didn't do well or his natural weaknesses, but instead we admire him because he figured out what he did well, and he did it better than anyone in history has ever done it. And part of the excitement I have about Gallup is we've got a neuroscientist on staff and we're coordinating with other neuroscientists. And I believe that w the brain, the, the study of the brain is progressing at such a rapid pace that you're already able to do a brain scan and start finding out where talent shows up in your brain. If you have a skill as a musician or as a tennis player, they're starting to find out that certain neural pathways will light up uh, when, you're, when you're using that talent. And I'm excited for the coming years when you know, maybe a, a low-cost brain scan will help you identify what some of your areas of talent are. So that could, that could be kind of a, a new breakthrough, Gabe, in the coming years um, in addition to an assessment. Or instead of an assessment, you might be able to see that, hey, you have something called discipline, and here's how it shows up in your brain. This is why you were so orderly, so organized. And, you know, many people aren't. Many people are kind of cluttered and messy, but, but you have this uh, uh, neural pathway that, that means that naturally you want order, and so you have you have this talent called discipline. We so, believe that so people Paul, are just as a yeah, just as a quick clarification on that. Then, so you must be asked that often, right? I mean, do I do my strengths change much, right? I mean, I, I'm I mean, at 16, it sounded like you were saying things are kind of set when it comes to brain activity, but um, you know, do you find that you know, quote unquote, people's strengths change from year to year or decade to decade, or how? I guess not. Is that kind of what you're saying? It's it's it, it's it's not common that they change very much. So we have a very high test retest validity. We haven't done some you know 50 year studies. Obviously, this is too new. But but what we're finding is that the test is very uh, accurate. You know, year after year, and there's very little change. There is something called neuroplasticity. And scientists are starting to, you know, are delving into the question, how much can the adult 
brain change. But by the time 16 is not is too early, but sometime between 18 and 22, maybe even up till 25, your neural pathways are probably configuring. But then they kind of harden. They don't. They're not permanently hardened, but but because there can be some neuroplasticity. But I think uh, for the most part, you, you, when you're 25, you're going to be kind of the same natural patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving, you know, for the next few decades. That's just how the human brain works. Um, but I'm sure we'll discover new things in the future that are exciting. Interesting. So bottom line is you'll become successful because of who you are, not because of who you aren't. And one of the images or metaphors that we could use for this is that, you know, do you want to be a well-rounded circle or do you want to be a star? And I, I think it's, it's fun. A lot of us want to be a star in our sphere. If you want to be a star salesperson or a star performer in, in your profession, stars are jagged. They have points. And, and so, you know, they, they're, they're not well-rounded. You, you can be a star by being extremely good at one thing, and that leads to uh, great success. And then finally, um, so moving forward into the Strength Finder 2.0, this has been the best-selling book on Amazon for years. Uh, this year it's third, but overall it's been on the top ten list for seven or eight years. And, and so this is not a book. This is a movement. Um, and I mean, is that why you think it's been, I mean, I've been amazed to watch it. I'm a big fan of strengths, don't get me wrong, but I mean, it's dominated Amazon for a whole decade. Yeah. Is it because, I mean, why is that? Maybe it's because, like you said, it's the movement piece. It's not a something that comes and goes. It's a, this is a, a long-term kind of strategy. Well, why is it so popular? Well, if you've taken it and you were blown away by how accurate it was and then you talk to other people about it, then they want to take it too. So it's yeah. inherently viral, even though from an engineering and advertising and marketing standpoint, you know, Gallup doesn't do that. We, we don't do marketing and advertising. We're primarily a management consulting firm. So we do very little uh, in terms of what I've experienced as a consumer Internet product entrepreneur. And so the potential when you start adding some virality and some advertising and promotion and getting thousands of coaches trained, I mean, the potential is staggering. And a billion does seem impossible, but when you think about six billion people will have a smartphone by 2020, and we have an iPhone app and an Android app, it's not impossible for us to reach a billion someday. Um, a real quick definition of talent, and, and this is what we really measure in the StrengthsFinder assessment, is talents are naturally recurring patterns of thought, feeling, or behavior that can be productively applied. Talents reflect who you are, not what you know, and talents represent your potential for strength. A strength in our definition is the ability to consistently pr provide near-perfect performance in a specific task. And thinking about sales, you've got high-performing salespeople that are incredibly successful. They can move from company to company or from product to product, but they have the ability to provide incredibly good performance because of all the strengths that they have developed. But they do it in different ways. No two top performers are going to be exactly the same. And so StrengthsFinder starts to give you a, a sort of how you're different from others and how you're the same as others. And the formula that we teach is that talent, the raw natural talent that you have developed as, as you're growing up, uh, times investment, skill, knowledge, experience, equals strength. And so strength is a development tool. It's not, when, when you take it and we tell you what your strengths are, you're not done. You're actually just beginning the journey of developing those talents through investment into strength so that you can experience excellence and you can be a top performer. Now, shooting to sales for a minute, um, as you look at the 34 themes, the 34 strength themes that we identify in our assessment, they fit into four different categories. There are executing things, people that are really good at getting stuff done, but they, they might get it done in different ways. I mentioned discipline. Well, people that are very organized can get things done by being organized and orderly, but other people might have something called restorative, which means they're really good at fixing problems. They're drawn to problems and they love to fix them. And achievers, on the other hand, are just hard workers. They set the pace. They're going to you know, burn the midnight oil and they're going to get stuff done. So people that get stuff done do it in different ways. Influencing themes, there are eight of them, and this is how you get influence, you know, get other people uh, to do things and, and, and um, lead, lead teams or, or, or cause movements to happen. Uh, relationship building, there are nine themes that are all about interpersonal relationships. Um, and these are, again, productivity-oriented strengths. These are not just for fun self-awareness. They're all about productivity and results. 
And then the strategic thinking themes. My top six themes happen to be in the strategic thinking arena which leads me to believe that I'm pretty good at strategic thinking. But guess what, Gabe? I'm not really good at getting things done or organizing teams. Every company I started, I started seven companies, I would replace myself as the CEO within a year or two because I was dr driven crazy by having to meet with people or manage people or especially sit through meetings. It drove me crazy so, to sit through meetings. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> So what, Paul, is your top, what, what's your top strength on this? Mine is the same as Ken Krogh's. We're both learners, number one. And, and then I have input and ideation and intellection and, and strategic. And then I have analytical, number six. And so I'm constantly in the world of ideas and looking for innovation and learning and, and strategizing and analyzing. So that's the world I live in. And if Gallup allows me to focus on that and not to do what I don't do well, which is manage people and, and you know, communicate with people and so on, I get to, um, I get to thrive in, in my role here. And you know, Gallup is really wonderful at, at partnering you with people that are good at executing or, or the, the influence things that I don't have. Yeah, Paul, one of the most powerful comments you made to me earlier was, you know, I think you said there's no such thing as a well-balanced leader, but there are well-balanced teams, and it sounds like Gallup kind of drinks its own medicine in that regards. Is that correct? Yeah, we do. We do. And we encourage all of our clients. We have hundreds of clients worldwide, including many of the largest companies in the world, you know, with massive employee bases, and we teach them strengths and strengths-based leadership, strengths-based management. Um, jumping ahead, I want to talk a little bit about the benefits of a strengths-based approach. People who focus on using their strengths are three times more likely to report having an excellent quality of life and six times more likely to be engaged in their job. And you know what? There is a real problem in the world, and you know this, uh, Gabe, that only 30% of American workers are engaged in their job, and worldwide only 13% of employees are engaged in their job. So, in the workplace, we often treat people like robots or machines, and we expect them to do stuff in the way we tell them how to do it. But in reality, they're emotional, and they're all different, and they all have different sets of talents. And unless we understand and provide a, a job, a role that fits their natural talents, there's a tendency for people to get disengaged. And so we've done studies in many, many hundreds of uh, clients where uh, there's all kinds of benefits at the employee level and also at the team level of a strengths-based approach. And there's also an improvement in the well-being of employees um, in, their, in their overall lives. They experience more happiness, more energy. They smile and laugh more frequently in a, if they're using their strengths multiple hours a day. And they experience less stress, worry, and anxiety and pain if they are using their strengths. And so when you're not in a role plays to your strengths, you're kind of, uh, it, it, it opens up a Pandora's box of, of other issues in your personal life. Um, a couple of companies that have been public about their use of a uh, strengths-based approach, Facebook, uh, I, I saw Mark Zuckerberg's top five strengths on a Facebook post that he did in 2009. And Sheryl Sandberg on her book tour uh, for Lean In a couple years ago was asked by the New York Times what was the most important business book she'd read in recent years. And she mentioned Now Discover Your Strengths. And then she goes on to say that we focus on what people's natural strengths are and spend our management time trying to find ways for them to use those strengths every day. It's a beautiful picture of what a strengths-based culture can look like. Another wonderful company, Rackspace down in Texas, the chairman, Graham Weston, is very religious about using StrengthsFinder. They have thousands of employees, and they've used StrengthsFinder with all their employees, with their families, and they've built a strengths-based culture um, that, is, that is really powerful for forming strengths-based teams. Now, I'm going to skip, we're, we're running out of time, but Gallup does define employee engagement around these 12 questions. We've had probably 30 million people around the world answer these questions, and so we can benchmark what companies are engaged, what companies and teams are not engaged, and we can help you diagnose, well, what's wrong with my employee base? Why aren't they engaged? We can kind of help you zero in on that. But question number three is important. It says, at work, I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day. Less than a third of employees can answer that question with a strong yes. And so we've got a, a and is that so Paul, is that kind of the strengths question? That that's kind of the strength question out of the twelve here. 
That, that's right. That's, that's very much yeah. the strengths question in the, in the Q12. And um, what happens is if a manager, and I, I told you I was a, not a good manager. I like to turn over the reins to someone else later. But I was the worst kind of manager because Gallup um, says there's three kinds of managers. The managers that give you negative feedback, they focus on what's wrong. The, the managers that ignore you, <laughs> which is kind of what I tended to do because I thought I was empowering my users to kind of be self-starters. But I ignored people for a long, long time. And then the, the best kind of managers focus on strengths. And look at the enormous difference. If you have an ignoring manager, there's only a 2% chance that employees are going to be engaged. If you have a uh, strengths-based manager, there's a 61% chance uh, that the employees are going to be engaged. I mean, that's a massive, massive difference. And why does that matter? Why does employee engagement matter? Well, we've studied uh, hundreds, thousands of teams uh, in hundreds of companies, and what we find is that there's a huge connection between business results and employee engagement. There's less absenteeism, way fewer safety accidents in companies where that matters, less turnover, higher customer metrics, and higher productivity. There's also earnings per share growth that is off the chart for the most engaged companies. So we, um, we, for the first time uh, in our history at Gallup, are now studying the strengths that are found in hundreds of different occupations. We have such a large database and it's growing so fast that we can say, what strengths show up most frequently among salespeople? And this is a very detailed graph, and, and I won't go into too many details, but you'll notice that there are certain strengths that really show up frequently among, among salespeople much more frequently than in the global average. And so uh, strengths like Lou and communication and positivity, these are, these are uh, strengths that show up. And as a manager, you figure out what your employees, your, your sales employees' strengths are. Each strength comes with uh, what it is, what it does, what it brings to a team, and also what it needs. And my, my shortcut for being a better manager than I've ever been in the past, if, if I ever start another company or, or, or run a team, is that I will study very carefully the strengths of every one of my employees to find out what their needs are, what they love to do or what they love the most and what they hate. And I will adapt my management style for each person based on what will motivate them and what will allow them to be the most engaged at work. And so we, are, we have these decks of 34 cards that managers and leaders can study to quickly understand, hey, if, you're, if your employee is an achiever, they need freedom to work at their own pace. They can't be held back by other people. Otherwise, they'll go crazy. They'll be, they'll be disengaged. Likewise, if employees have high competition, you motivate them by giving them challenges and performance comparisons. You have a leaderboard. If you have a sales employee that's not high in competition and you try to motivate them with, uh, hey, let's do a contest today to see who closes the first sale. We're going to give everyone a bonus to who's the first you know, person to close a the sale. They'll be turned off by that, not, not motivated by that. So the 34 themes can be overwhelming, but as you start to study the themes in each person in your organization, you have the incredible opportunity to help each person realize that their natural talent is, is this and that, that you can help them develop that and soar and, and really experience excellence in their role by playing to their strengths, not someone else's not by following a cookie cutter formula saying here are the 12 things you do as a salesperson. No, each person should play to their own strength. And with that, each person can experience positive outcomes. So here's a slide just showing some of the resources that are available from Gallup. And then uh, we've got uh, books for sales employees and sales managers and leaders, also for teachers. And then I'm excited. The reason I'm so excited at Gallup is that, that we're publishing a book next year called Strengths-Based Parenting, where hopefully millions of parents can be exposed to the idea that instead of just looking what's wrong with your kids or why they're misbehaving or what's wrong, understand their talent and their strength. This book is being written by Don Clifton's daughter, Mary Reckmeyer, who's got a PhD in child development. She's been running our child development center for 35 years. And every employee at Gallup whose child goes through child development center gets a note every day from a teacher to comment on a positive indication of talent in that child. A three-year-old, a four-year-old, a five-year-old, and over time these employees' children 
end up with a portfolio of all the good things about that child that indicate a potential area of talent for their future. So what we're now finally doing with, with releasing this book for families is that we're kind of going to hopefully counter those headwinds and start shifting the winds towards helping everyone see each other, especially the people they love and care about most, through the lens of what's right rather than through the lens of what's wrong. So with that, Gabe, I'll turn over the, uh, the rest of the time for you. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. Now, I wanted to dive into a couple things and focus on um, what is your superpower? How do you unleash it in yourself and others, especially in sales? What you're seeing here is a picture of Iron Man that's been drawn here in our office uh, here in Provo, Utah, to help people as they see that, to remember to utilize uh, their superpower. This was actually in the the office of our CEO, but I wanted to go through four things that I think will help people um, recognize in themselves and others the, the concept of superpowers. So the first one is hiring for talent. Um, the way to do that, two quick points on that is really understanding um, who your best people are and then making sure that you um, recognize who your best is and only talk to your best. The second one is focusing on strengths or focusing on superpowers. Um, to do that, you've got to understand your own, and then you've got to understand others. Number three, you need to engage by gamifying. Um, you want to make it fun and visual, and then you want to recognize that people are unique. Uh, you can't treat everybody the same. And then lastly, number four, it's about systemizing and optimizing. Um, we're a big believer that you've got to focus on what you're best at, but then you've got to surround your, yourself with greatness. And I want to talk about what that looks like in sales and bring together, I think, some of the things that Paul talked about as well as some of the things we do here at Inside Sales. So the first one is, is hiring for talent. I know Paul and Gallup are big believers in this. This is something that Gallup uh, had, had taught me, and I loved the idea. I wanted to bring it out here. If you, if you ask people this question, consider the best salesperson you've ever known. What makes him or her great? My goodness, I have asked that question to probably thousands of people, and I'll tell you, never have I got an answer um, with the bottom left-hand box. Whenever I ask that question, people always say, Man, you want to get a great salesperson. They're resilient. They're hungry. They they listen well. They're they've got the drive and motivation. The education or the GPA doesn't even factor in. The problem is our whole entire hiring system is built on things like GPA and job experience, and it's not even predictive. It doesn't actually matter as much. The X factor is in strengths. It's in recognizing superpowers in people because that is what leads to excellence in a role. So that's an important point to remember. Number two on this is ideally, if you're going to go with this type of recognition of strengths and superpowers, you want to start and only talk to people with talent. Sometimes I find this analogy, this analogy here resonates. So if you're a basketball fan, you probably know the name of Newt Bull and Bugsy Bogues. Well, in 1985, the Washington Bullets selected seven foot seven new bowl to play for their team. Um, when the general manager was asked why he would pick a player from Sudan with such minimal basketball, the GM said, um, he actually quoted Red Arbach, uh, a great basketball coach. He said, you can't teach height. Now, being tall is an important advantage in basketball, and it's something you either have or lack. The analogy to height in the hiring process is that the talent interview must come first because talent is tough to teach. Interestingly, the Bullets drafted two years later a guy by the name of Muggsy Bogues who stood about two and a half feet smaller than Manute Bull. Um, talent is best measured when you really structure it at the first of your hiring process. Very often, I'll find that, you know, using the basketball analogy, somebody may want a center, but they fall in love with someone the same height as Muggsy Bogues, five foot three. 
you've got to start with talent. If you're looking for a center, start with people seven feet and above, and then you can see if people fit your culture, if there's other attributes that you're looking for. But you want to start with the thing that's harder to teach. You don't want to fall in love with somebody who doesn't have that innate ability. So I'm a big believer if you're going with this approach, stick to it and put it at the first of your process. Now, next, thinking about focusing on superpowers, um, both in yourself and others. Uh, we're a big believer in concept, and we've often used the mantra um, uh, by a company that we've recently purchased called Persagenics, and they outline four kind of personality types um, that fall into the dominant, analytical, amiable, and expressive. Um, for me, I'm actually expressive personality. I'm about, you know, relationships, big pictures, uh, I'm a fast talker, fast energy. Sometimes I'm embarrassed, I'm a little embarrassed to admit it, but I have part of me that can transform into a, a used car salesman. This is me on the Dreamforce floor about two years ago, and I've got a group of about 50 people who've gathered around, and it's something that, uh, you know, I, I get on uh, the, the floor and do a little bit of a song and dance, and um, I think I've got a natural talent for that. It's something that um, it's important to recognize in yourself and see if you can't find opportunities, as, as Paul talked about, to see if you can't do more of that. The key, though, is you've got to start recognizing what other people are, what their strengths and superpowers are. So I, I went ahead and put up a picture of our CEO here, Dave Elkington. If you ever work with Dave Elkington, uh, you got to know that you know, he's, he's, a, he's a straight shooter. He's a dominant personality that's about results and control and bottom line, and um, it's, it's all about time. When you, when you approach a person like this, you don't walk up and shoot the, bull, shoot the bull with him. You walk up and say, you know, Dave, do you have five seconds? I had three points I wanted to cover. And then you hit those three points, and you're in and out. Um, on the phone with sales, um, in person with sales, You've got to recognize other people's strengths and superpowers and then act accordingly as you move forward. Now, number three is um, engagement. And Paul hit on this. Nothing better when it comes to engagement than the Gallup Q12 to really measure and understand what's going on. We've done some recent research in the area of gamification and the ability to make things fun and entertaining, entertaining to really tap into that naturally competitive drive of salespeople and use that as a tool to engage. And the two things that are coming out of some of the findings are, number one is um, you've got to make it fun and you've got to make it visible. So if you can make things you know, on your sales floor visible so that as people walk by or as leaders walk by, there's dialogue around it, it can be extremely effective. The thing that we're finding more and more with this, um, and this again goes to strengths and for powers, is that people are individually motivated. Um, what you're seeing here is a tool we call Power Standings, and what it does is it actually has somebody take a small assessment before they start um, to try to capture a little bit about their personality so that as gamification challenges are designed and organized, it will actually send them personalized messages based on their unique personality. So, for example, if I'm an athlete who loves to compete against other people, what you'll see is um, a message that says something more like, hey, you just got passed by you know, John Doe. If you're more of a personality like a rock climber, more individually motivated, the message may be slightly different, saying something like, hey, yesterday you, you, know, you did better on X, Y, and Z. And it tailors it to that individual. And boy, is that important when we're talking about engagement because it's about the individual, not about the masses. Now, last but not least here is thinking about building a system and optimizing around that. I feel like um, if you're going to go this direction with strengths and, and superpowers, the more you can build tools around to support this mentality, the better you are. But the thing I wanted to focus on here is surrounding yourself with greatness. So I, I put together this concept 
is the salesperson, we know you've got your good stuff, your strong con customers or prospects, and you've got your bad stuff. Um, the problem is, just like Paul talked about when we do individual, you know, one-on-ones, we often focus on our worst um, rather than focusing on our best. And you, uh, you're, you're seeing here kind of rep activity is equal across both your, your best and, and your worst. The thing that we're finding out of our data, if you can kind of see that, is your close rate is much, much higher, obviously, on your people who are better, your customers who are your strength customers, your superpower customers. So you've got to start thinking about how can you align your effort on your best people. So number one, again, you've got to recognize who you are and your strengths. But then as you work with your customers, you need to know who's most likely to buy from you. And then you've got to double down on that and really focus on it. Now, I think there's some great tools to do some of these things. Again, InsideSales.com has a predictive analytic engine called Neuralytics to help you identify those around you and who is your best. And that system can help you actually have a strengths-based selling mentality for those around you. So those are four great points if you want to build a strengths-based organization. Again, hiring, looking for that talent-based concept that Paul talked about. Number two, focusing on superpowers. Number three, engaging and thinking about gamification and the individual nature of that. And then number four, trying to build a system around it. Make sure that you surround yourself with greatness. So I'll end with that. Thank you so much. in the right-hand side of your um, console there. There's some great uh, downloads, uh, one on our gamification platform and one on our sales indicator, and a few things from Paul. Paul, do you want to just mention what those two offers are and, and kind of what they are for the group? Well, certainly. The first um, is actually a really popular annual or semi-biannual report that Gallup does worldwide on the state of the, of the workforce worldwide. It's got a lot of great ideas and, and insights and analysis for leaders and managers about humans in the workforce, engagement, strength. There's some mention of, uh, of how powerful um, certain things can be to engage a, a workforce. But uh, that's the main one. And then, of course, uh, we have many strengths-related books, including strengths-based leadership. So we just wanted to mention uh, that one for, for managers and leaders. Great. Uh, we have a few questions coming in, and um, we're, we have kind of a hard stop at the top of the hour, so we've got about 12 minutes here to do some questions. Um, one comes from Steve, and uh, he says, this one's for you, Paul, do you think the indicator of the engagement uh, based on negative feedback is a reason management focuses on weakness. They don't know to focus on the strength and the benefit. So rather than ignoring uh, they are doing something, just the wrong thing. Valid conclusion? I mean, yeah, I think, I think definitely um, when you are critical, when you are hounding, when you kind of whip your employees into shape, you do get results. Um, you also get some long-term results that maybe aren't optimal. Um, you don't get the best results. You, you get some results, but, you know, it's better than ignoring uh, employees. It's not nearly as good as a strengths-based approach because uh, in terms of long-term benefits, um, you know, people, when they feel like you care about them and you're trying to uh, help them develop their strengths and use their, use their strengths, then you get more engagement, you get better performance, and you actually get more longevity, less, turn, less, less turnover. So, yeah, I think that's a good conclusion. I think it, it does work better than not doing anything. Great. Thanks, Paul, and thanks for the question, Steve. Um, I've got another question here from Todd, and he says, um, Gabe, this one will probably go out to you. He says, I like the idea you mentioned about surrounding my salespeople with great prospect, prospects. 
but I'm tired of scores um, that nobody uses. How do I make my people focus on our best stuff? Yeah, um, I mean, you know what, Todd, that's becoming a huge problem, I think, in the industry. Everyone's really jazzed about, I've got an MQL this, and I've got a lead score here and a prospect score. The problem is nobody's using any of it. So you've got to, number one, see if you can't find tools um, to be able to build a structured cadence around your best people. It's no longer enough to just identify your best. You actually need to action it. Um, and you could hook up with me. Please do on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to share some of the things I've found to do that in a more structured manner. Perfect. Thanks, Gabe. Um, we've got another question in here from Elizabeth, and she says, I love that you talked about gamifying your sales floor, but like you said, it doesn't work for everybody because everybody is different. How do you manage that effectively? Yeah, um, yeah, the gamification stuff. So you, you, I think you said it right. I mean, we've seen it a lot. Uh, and Paul, you, you probably mentioned this, Paul, you know, everybody's just not the same. I think that's the whole concept of strength. And so, you know, putting a challenge out there for everybody is difficult. So I'm finding two things to be pretty powerful. Number one, remember that people are individual. Use a tool like InsideSales.com or another tool to get down to the individual level. But then the second thing is we're finding more rep-to-rep -rep activity, uh, that type of gamification where one rep can literally reach out to another rep in a version that we often call a throwdown. That kind of rep-to-rep -rep activity really plays on the individual superpowers or strengths of each person and can drive that engagement and heighten the motivation on sales teams. Perfect. Hey, this is a this is a fun one for Paul. How does Gallup recommend dealing with weaknesses? So it's a great question. It's probably the maybe the most common question that we hear when we talk about strength uh, and the strength philosophy. Um, there are so many strategies for what we doing what we call managing around your weaknesses. Um, you know, ignoring them sometimes works. Um, but a lot of times what you need to do is a much more proactive strategy. You need a system or a tool to kind of shore up your area of weakness. Or one of my favorite things is to partner with someone, to find a coworker or a friend who actually has an area of talent that you don't have and to come up with a partnership and, and let them do what they do best and you do what you do best. Um, I've talked about being a terrible manager but and I'm not a really good salesperson. I'm not a good closer. I get caught up in you know visioning and 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 talking about the future, and I get really passionate. I never remember to ask for the close. But in terms of if I were a part of a sales team, you couldn't find someone who would be more uh, diligent in terms of encyclopedic research on the leads, the competition, learning everything there is to know about the industry and about each company, and coming up with all kinds of clever tools and tactics. And so. Um, I would make a great partner for someone, but I wouldn't be able to do, you know, a certain thing by myself. I, I can't go and lead, generate, and open the door, and close the sale. So we have a book called The Power of Two that illustrates the example of fantastic partnerships where, you know, two people, even Mark Zuckerberg uh, talks about early on, people like Dustin Moskovitz, um, who were incredibly valuable partners who saw the revenue potential and the business potential when he was really thinking of a, of a you know, less, less than that. So uh, the, I think the best way to manage around weaknesses is to, is to find people uh, who do well what you don't do well and form uh, great partnerships. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, Mike, I, I, I love the, you know, when thinking about managing around weaknesses, I love the complementary partner idea because I think, Paul, you had mentioned this once to me, and that was, Great leaders know who they are, and then they know who they're not, and they are able to surround themselves with pretty powerful people. And I think that's way, way easier said than done. Yeah, I totally agreed. Hey, um, here's one more question. We'll probably just take one more, and then we'll, and then we'll call it quits. Um, it's uh, can gamification still be used with very small teams, one to two inside sales folks? 
I think it can. I mean, think about gamification. You know, uh, what it's trying to mimic is an interaction between two individuals. So think of a chess match. You know, you don't have 50 people obviously playing chess. It's just me against somebody else. So uh, if it's one person and there is a manager, I've even seen that be effective to kind of make sure that it's more visible between a manager and a rep. With two people, that opens up a whole new world. And I think absolutely gamification-type principles again, as you'd see in a chess match, can be structured and utilized to really heighten engagement and drive motivation between those two individuals. Great. Thanks, Gabe. I want to thank everybody for joining us today and uh, for Paul Allen for joining us from Gallup and Gabe Larson. They're both out on, in the field today, and I appreciate you guys calling in and being a part of the webinar. Um, if nobody has anything else, we'll sign off. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Mike.